All right. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Hear About It podcast. I'm your unreluctant host, Will PB. This podcast is made in Connecticut, USA, and I am here talking to the spoken word poet, Adam Rush. Um, if you are watching the video of this podcast, you may notice that my glasses are broken. I just want to be clear, I have noticed that as well. I started really getting back into comic books because I've been talking to some talented people from the comic book world. Um, uh, so I started reading comic books again, and my glasses broke immediately afterward. Um, I also want to mention, if you're just joining us, uh, I'm here with Adam Rush. I have read Adam's poetry. I've seen him perform. I've talked with him, and I'm very happy to have him on the podcast. He has a long list of credits. He was recently named the Poet Laureate of Brookfield, Connecticut, which we'll get into uh, later on. Adam is working on an audio book. He's done interviews. He performs live, and he has lots of inside details on Danbury, Connecticut's history as a music town, which will be a large chunk of the latter half of this interview, um, because I've been hearing stories about this for over a decade. Um, Adam, thanks for coming on. Great to, to be on, on your podcast here, Will. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I feel the same. Um, so Adam, uh, Adam, I think you have like a slight stage name. So uh, let's, uh, let's start with that. Um, uh, let's start with how you sort of picked your stage name and also uh, a question. Let, let's start with your stage name, a Adam Rush. How'd you, uh, how'd you settle on that? I settled on that in uh, 1992. Um, I had actually done my first ever reading of poetry live at the Brookfield Library. Um, and shortly thereafter, I was working on some kind of pseudonym or pen name to go along with me performing. And I had thought Adam Rush being ATLM, you know, came from a, a line of poetry I heard from Walt Whitman. Uh, For every Adam that belongs to you belongs to me as well. So it had this being, this being and this binding of all our souls together. So I try to be a rush in my poetry. So not only inspire myself, but also inspire other people to go up there, read their poetry, play their guitar, tell a joke, whatever they need to do to express themselves. Um, Adam Rush was always meant to inspire those people. So being a rush. Um, then also, you know, the, the, the obviously the connotation of an atomic bomb. I'm really into the beatnik generation and the right. 60s history. So that idea that um, that generation came after the bomb um, and that plays another part of it. So it's kind of um, an atom bomb rush of poetry sometimes. Uh, I really like that actually. Um, I, I, I really did read um, and sort of explore um, those works from the beatnik generation. Um, so, um, and really just sort of, uh, you know, I really appreciate um, when artists from this era sort of harken back to that era because it it's so formative um, uh, in music history, obviously. Uh, you know, and uh, you mentioned about guitar. I'm, I'm really glad um, because, you know, especially in this area, I think, you know, um, sort of you choosing poetry and sticking with poetry um, and really that being your instrument of choice is sort of really unique I think you know like surely at some point you must have felt pr pressure to to pick up a guitar um, or something like that but it seems like you you've stuck with it and now you you team up with musicians you you perform over music um, and it's really engaging um, so uh, how were you able to decide that poetry was for you and stick with it and, you know, and, and not really like waver in that? Right. Or, or even go into singing perhaps as well. Right. Um, you know, resisting those temptations, I think started with a lot of the feedback that I would get from people and performing um, when they started saying to me, you know, you communicate, uh, you reveal things to us, you, one person most recently said you, you express poetry in a thoughtful and direct way. I mean, after you get that uh, feedback, it's really hard 
to actually step yeah. down from that, you know, and yeah. it, it, you know, and I know guitarists probably want to bring my neck right now, but <laughs> I mean, the pure idea that the words that you say can inspire people like that. I and mean, they're working on tunes, they're working on notes, they're working on, um, you know, Miles Davis quote, you know, it's not the, the notes you play, it's the notes you don't play. I mean, that plays a big part in, uh, in what I'm trying to do with poetry too, because I, I don't feel like poetry ha- is, poetry obviously is not journalistic, or, you know, it's not supposed to be completely, you know, direct in a way, it's supposed to be indirect. So when right. you take your indirect thoughts and words and you really connect to somebody directly, I mean, um, that's really probably what, it probably hooked me on more, it was more like I didn't want to do these things because sometimes you know, like anybody I sing in the shower, I do have a guitar, I play guitar, play bass in a hardcore band for one summer. Ah. Um, so, I mean, I did, you know, have these times when I did um, pick up those instruments as well, but I always found myself going back, almost being hooked to the words. You yeah. Know? So, you know, it's, it's, I think that's more of it. It's more of a, a love of the words and the, the being able to reach out to people more directly. Yeah. That's terrific. And I do, uh, I agree with uh, sort of your description of, of your poetry. It is um, indirect in a, in a way that I, I really appreciate. Um, you know, it, it's really good stuff. And, uh, you know, in my own, in my own dabbles with poetry, I guess I sort of lean more to the sort of that, you know, first person uh, Bukowski type, which you know, if you think a guitarist wants to wring your neck, I mean, once you get into that first person poetry, that's where it's like, it's just like, oh, my God, get out of here. <laughs> you know? But uh, but so so that's great that you do that. Um, I do a Bukowski, and, uh, Bukowski cover in my, most of my performances. Uh, oh, Uber, yeah. Great. Uber, which is a, a great one. For him to, I'm a big Bukowski fan. I would say he's he's definitely in my top 10. Oh, for sure for sure i mean i'm not discounting that you're capable of you know other notes and and stuff like that for sure um bukowski is yeah is great um you know um so you know one of the reasons i wanted to have you on among among many is uh you know uh the first time that i met you we started talking you started telling me this story that i i couldn't even quite comprehend where you were you had managed to do like an open mic that was sort of linked to a health company or a, a pharmacy or something like that uh, in Brookfield. And I was just like, I've never even, I would have never even thought of that. Like, how did you even conceive of that idea or, or see that opportunity and then, and then see it through? I didn't remember that one in particular. Um, I mean, doing open mics in different environments than just the bar, um, I think are a big, huge part. I mean, I was, I think you're talking about the community, uh, the common ground arts community, I believe. And okay. that was uh, where she, she actually set up. I remember it now. Um, we had a farmer's market there. They were one of our sponsors. Right, right, so right. She, this was a, a large place that was like a studio. It's right in Danbury. Um, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it was a, a common ground community arts coffee house they had a coffee house there every month and um basically they were sponsors so we had the farmer's market and then we had all different kinds of shows and different kinds of um events within that like uh to promote that for example we had somebody talking about environmentally safe farming we had a a speaker almost like a a ted a kind of a ted thing i call it ted arts where you get somebody up and they just kind of talk to people in a more intimate environment Right. about a certain subject you know and that that's a great way to break up a show so you're not just listening to just music you're getting that you're getting poetry we had a dancers interpreted dancers as well um so we get all the different elements i mean even in my um my band adam family um we had a live artist perform so nice. she would um, take pictures um and then sketch them out the day before in pencil and then paint them during the show and people could see her like they were watching a bass player. Um, and then right. we would switch it up where she would be painting maybe the crowd and reveal it at the end. You know, so we mix it up for them to make it as interesting as learning new notes or learning new songs. Right. Learning new approach to how you're going to display your art. 
Um, and that's really, um, really quite amazing to see art actually created in front of your very eyes. So, um, you know, you can, yes. you can, you can space that out with everybody, you know, um, especially nowadays, you know, these organizations, health organizations, farmers markets, um, they're always looking for, for ways to get their name out there. Um, we were, um, very doing, true. Doing an event at a farmer's market not too long ago in Brookfield. Um, we were talking about doing an open mic there. Um, but we'll probably do that next season because it didn't actually formulate, um, right before the weather so you sort of said in, in passing like creating an intimate event um i really especially with poetry in modern times i would really consider that to be your biggest challenge is is creating an intimate environment um do you think about that at all or do you just sort of let it happen i mean i, I think i've seen a few situations like so far, if you've ever heard them, they, they do uh, shows in the city. Um, they actually pick great venues uh, for that intimacy. But it's not, not only just choosing the right venue, it's also choosing the right performer. You know, just, just like back in the day when they do uh, Unplugged on MTV. Not every band right. was unplugged. You know, Megadeth wasn't unplugged. You know, there had to be a certain type that was able to cross over. And that's what you're really trying, trying to cross over because. Um, the, when the music gets lower down, it automatically becomes more intimate. And, and that's one thing that I've been trying to do. One of my, um, I call it like my quarantine ideals um, that I learned from being in the quarantine and shut down was that right. I needed to communicate on a more ground level without so much music um, in my background. Um, so I cut it down to working with duos and trios instead. Right. Um, and, and also working with singers and learning to harmonize in poetry at the same time, kind of like, you know, you would see in a, a rap song, the, the verse and the hook, you know, same kind of thing. Um, so it's, right. it's teaching me to communicate in a more effective way, I think, and really get the message out there because you only have a certain amount of time to get that done in life. And uh, I felt it imperative to do it, basically. Terrific answer. I agree. There is a lot of gold still to be found um, from our time in quarantine. Um, uh, we were talking to set this up. Uh, literally this weekend, you are in Long Island recording your audio book. Um, this past weekend, actually. Past weekend, right. Okay, so uh, how did, uh, what, what are the circumstances? Uh, did you choose Long Island? Is there a studio? I mean, um, I, the studio I, um, is called this studio called Studio Noir in Long Beach, uh, New York. And um, I recorded my first record at that location. And I've known the, the owner of it, uh, Benoit, uh, for close to 20, 25 years now. Um, wow. I used to do shows with him down in the city. Terrific. Uh, we started performing live. Um, we were even in a band called Element back then. That was kind of a forerunner of the Adam family. I've um, heard of it. So, heard of it. <laughs> I've heard of Element. <laughs> so we, we um, you know, we've been working for many years, so it's 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 very easy to go down there and work with him. He knows my poetry um, through with music and without music. Um, so he's in. He runs a great operation down there. He's part of a group called the Arts in the Plaza. And they do an art. Um, they do display. You know, art made from sandstone and all stuff that people crafted. It's a craft kind of program. He does the music for it, and it's uh, every Saturday and Sunday. It starts, um, let's see, Memorial Day, I believe, and then it goes all the way through October. Oh, wow. He's been doing that for 10 years. So um, he's um, really wired into that or he's into that a whole community down there, which is a great community. Um, so... Um, I easily go down there. I did 47 poems in like, I think we did it. It took, about, it took me about six hours to record 47 poems. You did 47 about, poems in six takes, hours. Yeah. What's that? Takes of each, about, about two takes of each, generally. Fun. Um, yeah. So um, some poems as far as five pages, some as much as three lines, you know, like a red wheelbarrow. Right. Poem, you know. 
Um, so, right. you know, it came, it, 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 as once we started doing it, it was really um, methodical and then very effective. And um, I'm really excited about it. Uh, so now the editing process, obviously, which is something that can help me with as well. And then, that's, that's very worth being excited about. I mean, uh, you know, I have sort of noticed, like, I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm the only one, but like in my own experiences in a, in a recording studio, you know, like, you know, I, in my experiences, you know, a lot of the times I kind of want to like linger and like dig for gold, you know, like, um, so how are you like, uh, I, and even even if you're not, I still think 47 poems in six hours is, is pretty wild. So, so how'd you, how'd you do that? Um, well, you know, I think um, definitely with uh, with Benoit, it's, it's easy to get off track, you know, take out his keyboard. He plays like five or six in different instruments. So mm -hmm. um, I'm never really bored in that scenario. Um, so I, I did have to say, I just want to do this, as we say, I was just saying, dry or naked, all the poetry, no music at all. Um, mm -hmm. for this particular project. And then if we ever needed to put something to music, we could if we wanted to. Uh, you right. know, that portability makes more sense. Um, but yeah, uh, we, we were actually, I think maybe a part of it did it, is both times that we worked on these projects, we had performed prior, very shortly before getting into the studio. So we kind of got our live thing out. <laughs> You know, with um, the scenario with uh, Friday night, our friend Johnny Mystic was playing. He put some Johnny Mystic's band at the right. uh, Candy's Cafe in Long Beach. And we, I got up there and did something with the three of them. And then we went into the studio. So it was pretty quick. And then the other time was this very similar scenario where he was doing a brunch with a bunch of different saxophone players. And I got in with a couple uh, jazz tunes with them, you know. Yeah. Um, so, which is, which is great. Um, it is great. Yeah. Then, then we jumped right into the studio after that. So it was kind of a warm up. So maybe we got it out. It was a little easier to do it. Um, but, you know, yeah. Ben also runs a professional studio. So for him to turn on the hat, turn around the hat, it's very easy for him to do that. You know, but that's the stuff, man. That's kind of what I'm looking for. Just that, that, that vibe, like, you know, you, you, you know, like sort of play a live show, go into the studio same day um that's that's really where it's at i think um so uh right so you were recently uh named the poet laureate of brookfield connecticut um i am impressed that uh that such a title is is possible um you're the first one yeah. how'd that happen is there a nonprofit looking for poet laureates i mean um, well, they're actually Actually, there actually is um, looking for poet laureates for towns and cities in Connecticut. Oh, wow. They've got about 30 or 40 now, I think, about that range. Um, wow. I found out about this particular vision issue because my friend is the treasurer of Brookfield, and he sent me a yeah. link and he said, you know, they're looking for somebody um, to do this inaugural role. And um, they had a pretty big, um, you know, application, which was fun to set up because so I know sometimes when you're doing a lot of these projects, you don't really stop and look and say, well, you know, I did this and did this, is this, you know, no one has the, has the ability of like um, a Derek Jeter to look at the videotape, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, for me to actually write it all down, I was like, wow, this, this actually fills in quite big. Um, and then I sent that application process. They had, they wanted a resume, you know, a cover letter and, you know, eight to 10 poems or so. Um, and oh. then I get down to the next level, and then they did interviews, Zoom interviews, uh, follow-up questions. It was pretty elaborate. It was pretty um, exhaustive, which was nice because then you, then it's easier to do some project like that. I think you make sure it's something that people really are interested in. Um, and All then right. Look, yeah. Turn or whatever. So that's terrific. I I did not know that. Um... I mean, it should have been obvious to me that the application would <laughs> include your poetry. Come on, Will. Um, yeah, if if you're you're just joining us, which I mean, this is on the internet, so you probably definitely started from the beginning. 
Um, but I do have uh, a good few more questions uh, to run by Adam. Uh, he's uh, we've only really scratched the surface here. I mean, I mean, you've got stories going back for decades. So um, he's got stories about about Danbury and 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 so on and so forth. So uh, we're gonna keep it moving right along. So we did the poet laureate. Um, so. I, I have this thing I wanted to say that was was kind of a dig because, uh, you know, I was in Brookfield uh, the other day and uh, and frankly, uh, the traffic was was terrible. Can you can you do anything with your position as a poet laureate? Can you just be like Costco is coming up on the left? And like, you know, like you probably know that by now, <laughs> like slow down, you know, <laughs> Pretty funny, like the person who won uh, our select woman in this town. One of her things was about traffic, you know, mm -hmm. which is a winning, winning thing because when you say traffic, nobody says, um, "Oh, she's for traffic." <laughs> you know, what <laughs> I mean? like, that's not like that's like the best thing in the world. Like, who's for traffic? That's that's yeah. on my list. You know? More <laughs> traffic. <laughs> um, I also recently um, I'm working on a poem with um, uh, uh, my friend uh, C. Reed, who played with a band called the District All-Stars. Um, I uh, met he, C. Reed uh, totally met randomly. Him, yeah. Me and him worked on a, a couple of tracks on uh, my generator record with Adam Family, where he, he does, I'll read a poem and then he reads his own piece to, to it that he inspired. And we were working on one recently and I, I told him that he should write something about traffic. And, mm -hmm. I thought, and just something funny about traffic, but also kind of sad. That's what I said. I think that'd be perfect because I could do the sad part and he could do the funny part. Right. Um, but uh, <laughs> so, like, uh, maybe we will have a piece about that because that's something that uh, we all remember, especially now. I mean, even before yeah. it was bad, especially here in Connecticut. It is, and like I, I thought about doing something to to talk about it, and literally, as I was sort of forming my thoughts I tuned into uh I was listening to WPKN on the radio and and the hosts there were talking about it they were talking about um uh, the interstate I-84 um so you know I mean um I mean even on a two-lane road it's just crazy I mean you know like um I'm about to ask you some questions about uh an interview you did in New Haven and literally from where I am, it's a straight shot of one two lane road from where I am to New Haven, Route 67. There should be no problems, but there are many. And so, uh, but yeah, so you did an interview with the musician Malcolm Tent uh, for his program on WNHU 88.7 out of New Haven. Great music town. And uh, I have a lot of questions about that. Um, to start, I noticed in that interview, um, uh, you were performing some poetry live. And, and then uh, during, during quarantine, you released a 45 minute set of your poetry as well called, you know, under a quarantine jams banner. Uh, you can find that on Facebook. Um, in those two performances, you actually opened with the same poem. I, I believe the first line is, uh, she walks the sun with her hand. Uh, I might be paraphrasing there. Um, I'm wondering if you, I'm wondering if you chose that, um, if, uh, if that's sort of one of your regular openers and how you, how you consider sort of arranging uh, poems. If you have closers, you have openers, stuff like that. Um, you know, that's a, that's a great, great question. Uh, I think uh, a lot of times if I'm doing an open mic, I, I will probably pick like three pieces that I'm going to do and then have one in my pocket as kind of an encore or to switch out. Um, you know, if I'm in a bar, I'll, I'll tend to do what I call my bar edition poetry, uh, cool. which is a little bit more rough, Bukowski-ish. Um, I think with She Blocks the Sun in particular, I find it to be a very accessible poem. It also has lyrics that I'm very comfortable with. Um, not only performing them, but I feel like they're pretty solid. 
And uh, so sometimes I will pick the poem, which, you know, for all extensive purposes, keeps my, you know, keeps my hair coming off my body. Something that inspires me. Right. I always try to do as an opening poem. Right. So to get a feel for where I'm coming from. Um, what I was doing a lot when I was working with a full band is I would do one totally solo. So people get that reasonable expectation. This is about poetry. This is something I've never heard before, so it's probably an original. And right. now the music is a, is a nice accompaniment. It's like, here's the appetizer. Now you're getting the full course. Um, so I think I do try to do a set that kind of builds on that momentum. Um, I will do a lot of the the Mad Blues or I Can Take a Punch Poems, which I'm sure you've heard um, more later yeah. in the group when I get the crowd a little bit more into what I'm trying to say. Um, because I feel like those are more uh, more poems that people can really uh, get a groove into. And musicians love those poems too um, because it allows them a, a sense of space. You know, spacing is really important when you're, you're working with musicians. Right. So, Quite so. You know, and that's that. So some of these poems I'll pick, or I'll, even the version I use in the live version is not the same as with the reading. Right. Because I'm changing lyrics to adapt to my select surroundings or using uh, reprisals, reprising something, saying it again, saying it more than I would normally on a printed print page or solo um, to kind of, you know, inspire the band to, you know, feed off those words. Yeah. Terrific. Um, people this far into the interview, um, I'm sure they're probably on on board with poetry or, or on board with you. Um, I think, you know, uh, definitely not every, you know, sort of attemp attemptive poet is is as modern as you. I, I think that's fair to say. And, uh, you know, um, you had this quote in uh, your your interview for WNHU. Um, poetry is not stuffy that I really, really liked. And how did you, how, how far in were you before you started saying that to yourself? My, I just saw my eyes just bug out on the, on the screen there. Sorry. Just, just my giant saucer eyes. <laughs> Anime. Your broken sunglasses, your broken glasses. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think maybe I think because um, I've used that that quote before. Um, that's the first time I used it. I think uh, where I actually use that particular line. It's just mm -hmm. that you know poetry gets this idea of seeing a person in a white dress, white long hair, kind of past. You know, oh, yeah. it doesn't have any kind of modern equivalent. Um, and that's something that um, I've you know maybe maybe when I saw Maya Angelou read it the first time during the inaugural, I think that might've been the first time I saw her read. Maybe I started to feel like the you know, poetry, you know, when I read the beat reader and I read that, you know, a lot of these poets speak in a more common language than a certain meter that I learned when I was growing up. Oh, wow. Um, so I think that learning to be unconventional, definitely the beat generation, Walt Whitman, um, even the romantics, uh, I think, um, you know, once you once you start getting into poetry, and uh, that was the way I was with anything, um, anything that I was really in love with, um, I would try to learn everything I could about it. So when I when I started writing poetry in the fourth grade, I started learning that I wanted to be a writer. And this is I learned all these things as I grew up, and I never stopped learning. Um, so it's a living thing for me. So when when this idea that it's stuffy and a little bit more remote. I get I get some hard time for these people that are you know hardcore purists. I'm not downplaying poetry. I'm just downplaying the fact that it's never really taught to you in the same mm. way as growing up. It's right. taught in this little box. It's Shakespeare so and true. everything else, and right. that's not what it is. You know, and right. Shakespeare even agree. Um, nothing can live inside that box. Nothing that's worth growing can live in that box. So um, once I learned that, you know. Um, yeah, it, it opens up this this idea where you can, uh, you know, tell people that you know this is not this is not your poetry that your grandma listens to, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> this is not your poetry your grandma <laughs> listens to. That might have to be <laughs> that might have to be some version of the title for this uh, this episode. <laughs> 
Yeah, terrific. Um, so obviously, um, listening to you, uh, so again, uh, 88.7 uh, WNHU, a radio station out of New, New Haven, you did this interview with uh, Malcolm Tent, who I actually saw out and about performing live. He had all his merch set up. Um, so we're going to start uh, getting into the, the Danbury stuff, but but still on 88.7. Um, I do have to rep, uh, you know, the ra radio station I'm most affiliated with one more time, uh, 89.5 WPKN FM sound on the sound out of Bridgeport. Um, but 88.7, I mean, you know, that really got my wheels turning because, you know, I've been in and out of the music scene for like 10 years. I've gone and seen incredible shows in New Haven. 88.7 has apparently been around since the 70s. And I did not know about it until you sent me a link with Malcolm Tent, who is this musician who I who I barely, barely got to see, you know, like barely got to find out about. And, you know, it, it really spoke to me in terms of like sort of, you know, like I don't want to be too harsh, but it, it seems like a lack of interconnectivity in the in the Connecticut music scene and you know like I I mean like I really like you know like I look for stuff I try to find new bands and still I hadn't heard about 88.7 so like how do you feel about that did you just know that New Haven had a radio station or well I heard from Malcolm about it um, and, right and he said that you know they're really open to doing live shows this was you know back at 2018, 2017. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, you know, I, I do a show with Malcolm anytime because I'm a very big fan of Malcolm, uh, not only for, you know, his music being a good musician, but also, you know, his uh, contribute, contributed to, you know, the Danbury music scene um, when he was uh, owned and operated Trash American Style. I mean, that was a, a cornerstone of this scene um, that gave people an outlet to, sell their um, merchandise their seven inches back then it was seven inch records back then i, I had one of my poetry books was sold there um, um so it, it's you know it's it was a, a meeting place for a lot of things they even did live shows and it was always a venue to do it um so i think that that um that is a big part of you know um, the scene around here and that is that amber has always been you know kind of a a brother or sister to New Haven, and it's kind of fed the scene. I had said to you before that, you know, Jim Morrison actually performed at Danbury High School the night right. before he went to New Haven and got arrested, which was put in the song right. Fake Peace Frog. So, you know, um, wow, I got all the that song again. In New Haven. So, you know, there is a link um, when you're looking at good music scenes. Uh, Danbury has always been one of those scenes that. That kind of is a is, is a classic Phoenix legend. It, it rises out of its ashes. It never truly goes away. And that the, the place that you know, there's places now that are trying to get that music back because the music's still there. The venues have always been an issue um, in Danbury. Um, but Sugar Hollow Tap Room, I, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, Sugar yeah. Hollow Tap Room, very oh, cool. Um, so Trash American Style, that's uh, Malcolm Tent's old place. Of the Jim Morrison story, I mean, uh, what else you talk about about venues? I I know there were some venues in the past that maybe. Well, back in the day, they used to do a lot of shows at uh, TK's, actually. Oh wow, uh, the the TDK's right? That's yeah, uh, TDK's, that's yeah. a uh, you get you get um you get like twenty one wings on your twenty first birthday at TDK's, so um, yes. the big big and, college uh, hit. For you know, sure. Uh, new Music Night. You probably heard of New Music Night too. Mm. Um, that's uh, WXCI, uh, started by DJs at WXCI. Mm. Uh, that's the longest running uh, live Danbury event. Um, they played. I didn't uh, know that. Recently, let's see. They, they played at Beatty's Lounge. They played at Greenwoods. Uh, they performed a couple at Molten Java, I believe. Um, Molten Java is cool. Absolutely. Basically, what it is, it's old style DJs um, from WXCI um, that would come, and they they used to call it New Music Night because when they started, 
part of the event, it was the music, but it's basically really good 80s music. Um, by oh, wow. And more kind of underground 80s um, music uh, that you wouldn't just normally hear on a, on a regular 80s night. I wouldn't call it an 80s night. It's a little darker than that because it's got a lot of great music that um, kind of overlooked from that era. And um, so they're hoping to do another one probably pretty soon. They tried to do it before the before the uh, crisis, the COVID crisis. They they tried to do it on a pretty regular basis. Yeah. Um, at different venues. I would I would definitely. Um, I'm excited to see that. I'll have to, to keep my eye on that for sure. Um, the uh, Gas Ball Festival was a big back then. So I think during that interview with Malcolm, we talked about the Gas Ball too. Um, gas know, Ball. Festival. Uh, the stage they have down at the green the lawn that's right kind of a maca of the gas ball festival because when the patriot garage was there you could see the train station and that was where the gas ball was and that's why it was kind of called the gas ball festival because it was kind of in the view of it in a way um now the band shell kind of represents that and that whole band shell and everything was created because of the gas ball it was never there before the gas ball. Um, yeah yeah i'm i'm obviously yeah I'm uh, pretty pretty familiar with that train station. Um, yeah, I uh, you know like uh, if you're if you're kind of uh, trying trying this out and you're from outside of Connecticut, um, you know uh, the the train station in Danbury. It's like right in the center of town, right by uh, the local state university, um, right by the hockey hockey stadium. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I I should I should ask this question because around s sort of that same time when music was I I suppose like larger in in Danbury um, in in terms of venues or however um, the the hockey scene was was larger as well <laughs> like the the Whalers right and the and the Trashers I might be like fudging the times here but. Did you sort of notice an overlap with that? Well, I do remember when, when that wasn't a rink, uh, basically, mm. there was nothing there. Um, right. Um, the music scene was before the rink. Um, when the rink initially came up, one of the big venues, this place called Colorado Brewing Company, unfortunately went underground because the owner actually passed away suddenly. And he was a big purveyor of getting that rink going. And wow. he had this two story that now it was a gymnastics place. It's right across from the train. Um, it had two floors, it had pool tables, it had its own brewing system wow. all set up back there. Um, so that really hurt when he passed. It kind of dampened what they wanted to try to do in that rink. Um, but the scene at one point was, you know, basically a type of scene where you could go down, you could go down Main Street or Ive Street. And there would be live music coming out of all five, six different venues. Um, yeah, you're and right. of course, of course, tuxedos and mob with people. Right, um, right. Uh, because a lot of people would come from Fort Chester, Westchester County, Stanford to actually come to tuxedos, um, which now that it's closed, they don't really do that anymore. But, right. Adam, Adam's talking about Tuxedo Junction, which was... A, a club in it in every decade basically <laughs> you know <laughs> it was kind of the center of all these things so you know with the overflow we created an opportunity for the hat city ale houses and the um, cousin larry started to become popular um but cousin but larry's is still there right no cousin larry's now i believe is a church i believe now oh wow yeah wow I gotta, I gotta study up. I gotta, I gotta um, find my new geography out there in Danbury. Uh, great answer, man. I'm glad I asked. Um, and then finally, uh, I've heard you mention uh, um, a restaurant called Billy Beans. There was an open mic. I mean, I, I've been in Billy Beans. Great food. I did not know there was an open mic, and especially that it was actually pretty popular. Apparently. Um, oh man. Yeah. Those yeah. Popular. Sure. Right on. They've since they still are around, but they have changed ownership, so they don't do the Tuesday open mic there anymore. Okay. Um, 
but it was great. You know, they had guest host at one point, so I would guest host, um, you know, and um, it wasn't like a rip roaring amount of money, but it was exciting to see getting people in. It kind of got my bug a little bit going with organizing shows, which is something I've, I've kind of played around with over the years, um, especially when you do a, you work with poetry, which is like a do it yourself, you know, um, kind of a rough and tumble, you know, who will let you put and read your words to it? Because it's, it's harder to book the music in some ways. Um, so I had to find my own venue. So I kind of, I did that for a little while. And uh, Billy Beans always made me feel like uh, I could take over the bar. And that, that anytime you can feel that way, you know, um, it makes it a very special place. It was a very special place. I met many people there and many musicians. And uh, we really miss it. It's a big part of the scene. I, I used to go there and do karaoke back in the day when I was younger. They didn't do mm -hmm. it when I was younger. <laughs> uh, karaoke night there and had good food. Um, so yeah, you know, Danbury, uh, like a Phoenix, Cousin Larry's, and then it was Billy Beans. And then before Cousin Larry's, it was Hat City Ale House. And then it was TK's or the Chicken Coop or Tuxedo yeah. you know, and the list Great go story. on and on. I mean, the idea that there were like more breweries and tap rooms, especially when craft beer is so huge the idea that there was a brewery and now there's not is actually like you know like what's going on what's going on out there yeah i mean uh well, now they, have, they have charter old brewery and, and they have very few more that popped up but colorado brewery that's true there, yes I way that. Ahead of its time. there was no doubt about that it was also a, a showing of like how you could be a sports bar be mm -hmm. a brewery and still do live music you know right it's just a matter of spacing in their case but they were kind of lucky to have everything um, at that place. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think that's a I think that's a great point. I, that's a great point. I you know I think um, you know like I will say about you know the Connecticut music scene like some of the places you do get get to get to play at as a musician it's like they're almost like on the fence about whether they're going to have music there or not, you know, and uh, definitely like you can really tell when a, a place is actually welcoming to, you know, sounds being made, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I, can, I can notice the difference when I used to go to, to New York town, New York, um, and the response I would get for doing original poetry. Um, I, I do mm -hmm. find in Connecticut the cover songs, the obsession with a lot of cover bands, is right. a comfort level too. It's it's something you know. So if I'm booking a Beatles band, I know what it's. Everybody knows what the Beatles play. How yeah. much different can it be? Right. Um, when you hear something like, well, it's poetry, original poetry, then it seems more dangerous in today's times <laughs> uh, because yeah. people don't want to hear, uh, or maybe maybe I should say they don't really want to listen as effectively as they could. Um, and that's, you know, a little bit more risky, I guess. Um, but it's, it's funny, you know, that's, that, that plays a part of it. When I went to Yorktown, it was a totally different response uh, of how they enjoyed the show, a little bit more respect or something like that. Yeah, and, and Yorktown, first of all, not a perfect place. And second of all, not, not that far away, you know, it, 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 it's, it's really odd sometimes, you know, like sort of the, the discrepancy that, that you're mentioning. Um, I do agree. And um, to that end, like how, I mean, it, it's harder to get around now, I, I think. And, you know, like uh, sort of before the COVID crisis, how did you, how were you sort of thinking, like, did you try to, how often did you try to, to get out of Connecticut and, and play elsewhere? Um, book tours, stuff like that? Um, well, a, a lot, before the, the crisis, definitely I was doing a lot of shows in New Yorktown and Peekskill, which is more mm -hmm. like driving distance. Um, you know, to do shows in the city and Long Beach, it's a little bit more of an operation. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do enjoy going down and playing in Long Beach a lot. Um, they're actually the first place I did my first show after the shutdown um, at the cafe, Candy's Cafe in Long Beach in 2020. Um, and so, you know, I, I love I love going out there. It's a good good community for me. Um, 
They're very welcoming to outsiders, and uh, they have a lot of original original artists down there. I mean, that's the bottom line. I mean, original yeah. people are willing to put themselves oh, no. on the line like oh, that. Sorry. Good, bad, or, or indifferent. I mean, in a way, they, what? I said, oh, no, very uh, ominously, because uh, we had our first glitch of the episode, which is incredible that we made it this long without a glitch. Wow. Truly amazing. Um, thank you, Comcast, or however we're doing this. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, have no idea. I have no idea who our providers are. Not yours, not mine, but uh, um, that's that's terrific. I, I'm, I'm going to cut you off there a little bit. Um, because I do have this one question. This is really sort of, um, this is really kind of my opinion here, um, sort of based on, on what I've experienced personally. Um, you know, when I was in college, which is about 10 years ago, um, I really sort of noticed there were a lot, like, so I'm talking about like early 2010s, I guess you would describe it. Um, I feel like in that, time period it was actually a lot more common to see spoken word artists doing kind of rock star stuff honestly like you know like I feel like you know first of all you would hear about the spoken word artist they would be playing kind of a large venue they'd be going on you know they'd have dates on their myspace or whatever I mean um, that's sort of how I how I feel. Do you did you feel that way? Have you in the Denver, in the Denver area? You think, or just in general? Just just kind just kind of in. Well, there I know there are some spoken words artists in in Connecticut, um, but I I do kind of think it was in general. I I think it was like I do kind of think in in that time period, like two thousand eight to maybe like twenty twelve, twenty thirteen you would really hear about like a, a spoken word artist kind of, you know, making some cheddar, like being a spoken word artist, you know? And it, it like, I was just like, is this going to happen forever? Like, you know, I mean, uh, do, do you, did you sort of feel that? Do you, have you noticed sort of like peaks and valleys in terms of people's interests? Yeah, there's always been peaks and valleys. Right. We're actually on a peak now with Amanda Gorman and the stuff that she's bringing to the table, uh, which okay. which is funny, her book of poetry um, is a lot better than the stuff she's read live, actually. She's she's quite talented. I mean, when you look at uh, ceremony poems the way she did for the inaugural and for different events, those are not easy to write um, when you're kind of commissioned to write. Um, but um, she's kind of bringing poetry back up from the forefront, which is great. Um, and that's kind of what you're talking about, peaks and valleys. It's funny that you say in 2008, I think that that does coincide with a lot of C. Reed and a lot of other poets that I knew around here that were performing. I was actually in hiatus at that point. I wasn't performing at all. I was actually writing at that point. Mm -hmm. um, I went on about a seven, seven year hiatus, maybe a little less than that, where mm -hmm. I wasn't really in the scene. After Ad City closed, I didn't hang out at Cousin Landers. I do know the people there um, because I met, met Billy Beans. <laughs> but uh, but like during that time period, I could see that uh, that would probably make a lot of sense. Um, you know, it's it's kind of like I don't know, roughly twenty years after the nineties. You know, rap kind of scene started to happen. Um, I mean, I think it definitely goes in cycles. I mean, you can tell just by the the, the different genres uh, um, of you know, I'm throwing rap in there because it's it's kind of right there with spoken word and poetry. Yeah, kind of I mean, way yeah, all I, together in its own way. Yeah. Um, it's it's just sort of it, different people have different opinions about that, but I mean, at some point you have to notice the link. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, Tupac and Notorious B.I.G. were perfect examples. Of, you know, poet poet rappers. I mean, they were poets. They had a, a command of language. I think that's what it is, a command of language um, in general. Um, does happen, you know, Kirk Cobain used to say, every 10 years or so, we have a spat of really good 
performers and artists and musicians. Um, so maybe we're coming up to a cycle of same for poets, but you know, poets have been around for hundreds of years, so um, we're not going anywhere in England quick, so that's for sure. That is, that was excellent. Yeah, I, I think we're going to pretty much uh, leave it there. And so, by the way, uh, C. Reed has come up a couple times in this interview. I met him. I, I've listened to his stuff. Uh, I'm very excited to to have him, him on in the near, near future. Um, Adam, thanks so much for, for coming on. We really covered a lot of bases. Um, I, I really, I really hope, uh, you know, listeners hung out and, and got something out of it. Um, if you, you know, if you're tuned in, it's, it's time to subscribe, you know, it's time to, time to like, it's time to follow, time to share. Uh, you know, that, that's how I feel. I rarely, rarely even ask. And, uh, and, uh, I think this is a little, got a little bit of juice here. So, so let's do it. Let's, let's get the steam train going. Um, Adam, thank, uh, thank you well for having me. I'm excited to to see you out and about now that it looks like maybe we can kind of sort of do that. Um, thanks for coming a, on, Adam. I've got, so, I've got a couple of gigs coming up. One uh, March 3rd and uh, Cellar at the Treadwell. Um, yep. Which is a, a music, they call it a music mashup. So it's a little bit of everything. Um, yeah. Hosted by Cap OB. Um, so come on down. That's a great venue, Cellar at the Treadwell. And then Good I'm food also at Cellar on Treadwell. I will not lie. Good food. I got. Oh. And I uh, make music in Danville too. I got a ticket there. That's not until June, but I'll be performing at the Mothership Cafe that noon on June 21st, which is Make a Music Day worldwide, basically. Um, and made for this year, it's about five to six different venues in Danbury. Uh, Mothership's one. The library. The um, Palace Theater. Um, so it's uh, going to be really interesting. I'm excited about performing in both of those. I uh, hope I can get up to our place too sometime and see you. Well, yeah, that's right. Uh, our place out of Torrington. Um, uh, that's where that's where we met. Yeah, I I, ha I have to say you were you were kind of a cool customer, Adam. I was like, you know, I, I just met you that day. I was like, oh wow, like I I, I was pretty impressed with your sort of sort of vibe um totally great having you on um i i am gonna hit uh hit pause on on a on a really fast hour uh for me personally um keep it locked everyone uh and come on back